freedom. This one is on something a little bit more complex. And I want you to, in my opinion, it's complex. And I want to um, kind of give a little frame of some of the things, how I think about this. It's what to do about sympathy. Now, that's one of those, I mean, I, I, unfortunately, I think about everything as energy, which you have to navigate, whether it's your own body or whether it's, you know, the, the world around you. And sympathy is such an interesting, complex interaction. I want to say that my relationship to sympathy um, varies from day to day. I now just realized I forgot to do some house cleaning stuff, right? Because I got too excited about what we're doing. I want to stop, hit pause and say, um, for those of you that aren't living with an overt disability, please turn off your cameras and go to the back of the room. The reason why we do this is that if you live with a disability, right? And we have been put in so many weird places, going things to restaurants, trying to get into bathrooms. We're always stuffed into the spaces that don't work. Like, I can't tell you how many constructed views I've had in my life. And so this, these series of workshops are intended more for, um, we want everyone to listen and, and be a part of them. But I do want people with quote, that identify with disability to be at the front of the room and not wedged in a corner. So if you're not, if you consider yourself living with the, with, without a disability, just try up your camera so you kind of go back to the room, the back room and, and, and come back forward. Um, so then the other thing about this is that because of laughter last week, last time, last month, actually it was two months ago, um, it was such a ripe conversation. This, the, this um, format will end at, at, in an hour and a half but I'm gonna stay on and I want anyone that wants to keep talking about this stuff and maybe go into a chat, chat rooms or ask more questions, more comments, hear more of your stories. We're gonna be on for another half hour after the, the 2.30 ending because it's so ripe. I mean, the idea here of these, thi of, of these works, of I want things spoken about that aren't usually said. I want the unseen experience of living with a disability to be out and talked about for both for our, ourselves to acknowledge between each other, but also for other people to hear, right? So, so stay on for the extra half hour if you want to. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, I might stop a couple of times and see if there are comments or questions as this is going on. And what we want you to do is actually raise your hand. Um, if you can, if you work a computer like that, otherwise just bust in, but um, and all of a sudden I'm forgetting, oh, on the bottom of your screen, there's a reactions. And if you click on that, you can see on the very bottom row, there's a raise your hand. So we might not be able to get to your question or comment. We may, but we will for sure stick on the back half hour at the back end. All right. Anything else I'm forgetting, Bethany, on... Um, um, one um, thing you can do if you prefer it is if you if you want to change your video settings, you can go to your video settings and change to hide video participants. That just cleans up the screen a little bit for people. Um, it'll take everyone off that doesn't have their camera on so you just see the people that are actually in the video. I'll also right. be spotlighting people throughout this. So when people come on and off spotlight, you may find that you need to readjust your view to either gallery or speaker, whatever your preference is. It can change <laughs> as I spotlight. And that's it. All right. So now hit, hit go play again on the sympathy thing. And so my relationship is, I've been in a wheelchair for getting around an accident for since I was 13, 42 years. And and my relationship to sympathy, whether, um, especially in the world around me, is has changed. It changes from day to day, but actually periods of my life. And, and one of the things I want to put out there at, right out front is that, that most of my life has been spent trying to push other people's sympathy away, right? To try to prove everyone that I'm okay, right? And sometimes that's been to my detriment. On the other hand, I also find so that's one side of it. I want, what I'm trying to do in this next couple of minutes is put out these signposts that shows you how paradoxical this experience is, right? So mostly I try to make everyone think I'm okay, including my family, including the people closest to me that are the most supportive, right? I actually end up trying to take care of them because, oh no, you don't need to feel sorry for me. 
But I also have found that there have been times where not I also find it's not has not been very constructive for my life, and I imagine some of you agree, um, to feel sorry for myself very much, right? That that's usually not productive. However, acknowledging the difficulty of your life is something that's necessary sometimes. So whatever practice you have to acknowledge in a healthy way, that living with trauma, loss, and disability, particularly disability, is a freaking grind. It's a grind and your story is hard, right? And, and, you, and what's interesting is that that acknowledgement doesn't mean I have to feel sorry for myself. And in general, if I were to oversimplify, one of the things I think about in relationship disability to our culture is that I, don't, I want them to see and acknowledge without having to choose the, the, the parachute of sympathy, right? Like, like trying to jump off the ship. Like, oh, my God, your life's so hard. No, actually, just sit with me and be with the truth here. And let's go forward, right? And, and, but, but then other things, you know, they're, and so it's so complex. And Kevin and I are going to talk a little bit about Kevin Kling's going to introduce him in a second. If I were to put, like, this is not a joke, but it kind of is a joke. Um, I'm going to tell you two little quick stories about where, where, where we're stuck. Um, I think that one of the, if there was a, a, a great like battle arena of sympathy or an arena of sympathy, like the Coliseum of sympathy for me in my experience has always been the grocery store, right? <laughs> because it's just a crazy place to go and there's so many different relationships going on in there. I can't tell you, especially because I'm in a wheelchair and I can push a cart and grab things off the shelf, right? I can't tell you how often right, people actually will, older people generally, but, but there are people that just want to acknowledge, like they look at me, like they do that, that you're in the aisle and also they see me wheeling up and down and they do that, that head tilt, like, oh, that you're, you, you know, and then some people, elderly people tend to be just wanting to say whatever they think. And so they say, you're, you know, gosh. And then there, there's that tone of voice that happens when they're the head tilters, calm the head tilters, right? And you're like, can I help you? It's not like, hey, can I help you? Dude, it's more like, do you need anything? Like, like, because, but it's their attempt with their tone to try to acknowledge and whatever, right? So there's that side of it where you kind of are, are an object of, oh my gosh, that must be so hard. That then, but in the grocery store, there's the, the other extreme. And the one story I can tell you about is like, I'm going, I'm, I'm, I've told this story to some of you have heard this before. I'm, there's a zillion examples of these in the grocery store. The great Coliseum of sympathy, right? Is, is this, then there's the other reaction, the opposite reaction, which is I'm going and I'm shopping for my son. We're getting groceries for the week and I, um, he's not there, but I'm thinking about him and I'm feeling guilty. I'm in the frozen section and I'm about to pull out a massive bag of pizza rolls. And I'm feeling kind of bad as a dad, like I shouldn't be feeding the pizza rolls but he loves them, he'll eat them. You know, I'm going through that dilemma and I'm, I'm holding, I'm holding this, this, this bag on my lap and this guy, probably about 60, 65, and he you can tell he's like a jogger and he's all dealt up and he's like in great shape. He's the kind of guy that's over buff for his, you know, and he comes up and says, he comes up and all of a sudden he, he comes up behind me and he goes, he comes right in my face and says, he says, oh my God, I was gonna ask you if you needed my help, but you're just crushing it. You're just crushing it. And he walked off, right? And it was like, what? That's the other side of sympathy, right? And one of the things Kevin and I are gonna talk a little bit about is, is maybe there's a middle ground. Maybe there's, as he sometimes says, either people think I'm in difficulty or they think I'm inspirational. And maybe the place that we all need to live is try to find that pit stop between the difficulty and the inspirational and figure out where that is and bring people to that place, right? So final story, here's another, here's another relationship. So I'm first starting yoga and um, I'm, having term, I'm having post-traumatic flash, flashbacks. It's big time stuff. I'm like on my yoga mat, I'm twisting, all of a sudden I'm back in time, I'm back in the hospital. I have to get up and I would wheel out to the front stoop of my, 
of my of the house I was renting and just sit there and be really quiet. Well, across the street, I had this probably 70 year old retired librarian, um, Eve, who who um, married when she was like 55, had been, you're, you, you know, I can only imagine a stereotypical, quiet, wonderful um, librarian, right? And, and, and she married 55 and then he died like when she was 60. And so she was a very sad, would walk around. She was just sad, right? And she was a very strong Christian. So in California, there's no, um, there's no, um, the walls are super thin, right? And so she'd be across the street, but she would blare her Christian television network really loud. And so like I could sit and hear that she was having a bad week or a bad day or bad few days when I was hearing Christian television the entire time. And, and she would, you know, she came, we walked over one time, she walked very methodically towards me. I'm having, I'm in the midst of one of these multiple planes of time, like experiences where I'm sitting there, like trying to just like, my reality is like, what's going on? And she's wearing, I want to get to picture, she's wearing, it's really hot out. She's wearing long, pants, long shirt, like a couple layers, her gardening gloves, a gardening hat. She's walking very slowly across the road to actually um, to talk to me. And I, and I try, I thought about like going inside, but then when she saw that I saw that I saw her, right? I knew I couldn't ditch, right? And I love Eve, she was great. But she comes over to me and she walks up really slow and she, you can tell she really has something important to say to me. Her whole body is whatever. And she wants to say, Matt, you know, I've been having a really hard time. And sometimes, some days I'm just so sad about my life and sad about everything. But then, then I look across at you sitting here on your front stoop. And I think that my life isn't so bad. Okay. This from one of the sweetest women I know. And at that moment, I felt, you know, like when you're trying to cross a river, and there are rocks you try to step across, that my head was one of the rocks that she was stepping across in order to get to her place where she feels better about her life, right? That's, I've like, my head was like a bobblehead of, of stepping stone. And she meant it. And that'd be the other, that'd be another side of it where people imagine, and then, you know, they imagine that, that your life might be so bad and that theirs isn't so bad. So it's not even that you're inspirational. It's like, and, and she meant it really well. So with that, I want to introduce one of my favorite people in the world. <clears throat> and we're going to kind of dance around all of these parts of this conversation. This is the Coliseum of Sympathy here. Imagine we're in a grocery store. Kevin Kling is a, uh, uh, if you don't know who he is, too bad for you. Right? He's a world famous storyteller and author. Um, one of my favorite people to work with. He actually, he and I do Body Mind Story together collaborate on all sorts of stuff. And Kevin is gonna tell a story or two. We're gonna talk a little bit after that. Um, and he's one of the ones that I struggle with a little bit with um, Kevin, just so you know, I struggle with you for a lot of reasons. Um, but, but one of them, and, and I don't, which story are you telling today? I don't wanna steal any of your fire. Well, after what you just said, I changed my mind. Yeah, of so, course I do. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I, I'm going to tell that one about my arm though, about people's perception. Yeah, so, but I can tell you that, can I just tell you, so Kevin pulled up the one arm that you move, you move, and then he completely paralyzed the other arm, right? So there have been times when working with them and like doing things like, one of the most amazing moments of my life, and, and Kevin, I don't want to like make you put on a spot here with how inspirational, but it's not inspirational. It's awe. I wish people instead of jumping off at inspiration would actually feel awe. Watching Kevin put on his shoes with strictly his feet is one of the most amazing things I've ever witnessed, right? And, and so I try not to talk about it, but it's one of those moments and you want to jump in, you want to help. And he kind of, some days you want to be helped, some days you don't, right? Kevin's one of those ones that we'll talk about that, but it's one of those things where he constantly gets me at that. He's got an unimaginable experience for me. What we share is that when we all share on this call is that we do all have our little places like trying to impossibly put on our shoes. Right. And what the relationship is to loved ones in those spaces is actually also very, 
very intense. And I've, I've screwed up. Sometimes I try to help Kevin too much, right? Because, because. All right, Kevin. Oh, Whatever that's you're going to go for. Yeah, this is, thanks so much, Matt. This is, you know, one of the reasons I changed my story is because there are stories that I will only tell for people with disabilities because, you know, there's just stories you can't really let out of the box, you know, because they people don't get it. And the first one I want to tell is, one you reminded me of being in a co-op and I was in a co-op and I was having the hardest time and there's people all around me and I should have just asked for help I should have done that's what, exactly what I should have done but I didn't and I was waiting for somebody and nobody was going to help me and then it all of a sudden occurred to me they're all in this co-op and they're looking he's and they're going oh no he eats wheat bran too oh god and look at him and it's like they they don't it's like uh they're eating this crap so they don't want to end up like me. <laughs> and there I am in their face. And they're like, oh, God dang it. What's he doing in here? I, you know, I got, I'm going out for a burger. And they're, uh, so <laughs> there's also, I think, a lot of pity and a lot of sympathy. And a lot of these terms are really projections from the people. You know, they're projecting, as you said, with the woman across the street. There's a lot of projection going on uh, to, to what is sympathy and what is pity. Um, one, of the, the, one of the examples that I want to talk about it, getting in, we've talked about this. Uh, one of my heroes is Richard III. And I love Richard III because, well, for one thing, he's brutal. And he, you know, he, was a, he was a good role model for when I wanted to get things done. Because I learned early, if you don't have a person in your life, an advocate, you'll develop a persona. You'll have a completely different persona that will help get things done. And I, I saw Richard III, and this is where I want to put in pity and sympathy, because everybody hated this guy. He's the most despicable. He's killed his brother. He's killed all these people. He seduced the woman whose husband he's just killed. So everyone just hates this guy. And then all of a sudden, near the end of Act One, this actor puts a glove on with one hand. Oh, oh, now Aaron just loves him. Aaron just, oh, oh. And I'm like, what the, what's going on? And I even thought, if people saw me put my socks on, there wouldn't be a dry seat in the house. You know, it's like what you're saying. And, uh, and so I, I was thinking, you know, but the problem with Richard is he never finds love. He never, he uses this, he uses sympathy and he uses pity only for gain and he never uses it to let people into his heart, his own heart. And I think that that is when I started to realize there's a great responsibility that comes from accepting sympathy and accepting pity. You have now entered a bond with somebody. Uh, you, you've, you've created a bond um, and you're responsible for that bond. And it, it's a beautiful thing, but it does come. I mean, when people say love is unconditional, that's the biggest piece of BS on the point. Love is conditional. It is conditional. When you love somebody, you, it, it, you know, you are allowing them to have their sacred spaces. So what I wanted to get to, though, is that sense of responsibility, because when I was a kid and people would talk about my arm is withered or crippled or uh, say you poor thing or what happened, I could tell by the words they chose, whether they blamed me, my parents, God or themselves for my condition. And with that information, I could get what I needed out of them. So the rhetoric, the way people used words, the words they used with me, I started to learn were different than the words they used on other people. And that I was in a world that was not built for me. And with that information, I, I knew a lot more about that person. I knew why they said it, uh, how they said, what they said, so many things around it. So I was teaching a class and I got these kids kids in this class and I was saying, what makes you different gives you power. And that's part of it is because of the sympathy card. So what, what, you know, what, what, what makes you different gives you power. It's how you look at the world, it's your perspective. And we all made superhero characters out of that. And then I went around the room and I was asking them, what gives you power? And I got to this little girl and, and she goes, I'm really, really shy. And she was super shy. She never said anything. I said, but why does that give you power? And she said, because sometimes people forget I'm in the room and I'm invisible and I know everything. 
and she did. She knew her, she knew everything going on in that room because of her, she could become invisible. And sometimes through our invisibility, that is what we, when we listen, and I think the key to both sides of this topic is listening. What do you hear? What do you, what do you hear that's actually there? And what do you hear that you want to be there? And that's where I'm going to leave it because that's yeah, that I want to me. follow up with a couple of questions, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Like about that. One of the things when, when I was talking to Kevin about what we're going to do here today, he made this distinction for me, for him, between sympathy and pity, which I think is a really important thing. And like I had thought about it too generally. I was thinking more as sympathy and kind of using some of the energy I have kind of late bottled up in me about people that feel pity. That's the energy I want to push away. Why do you say more about how you see the, the difference between sympathy and pity? Because, because what I say in this word sympathy, there's so many layers to it. We have to kind of different, pull it apart a little bit to discard the things you want, the things you don't want, you know, like all those things. Yeah, I'm agreeing with you about pity is the thing I try to avoid because I really find that is projection. I find that is really somebody is projecting that their own feeling of, of who I am onto me. Uh, when I feel sympathy, I feel an, a, a reaching out, which is very different. Uh, for me, it's someone, whether they're right or wrong, or, you know, and, and, but they're reaching, they're reaching out. Um, and you said to me, you called it a bridge. And see, this is what's important to me as I was talking to him, is that the thing that I do tend to resist is the pity thing, but I never thought of sympathy as a bridge. What I thought about it was a stepping off before they've crossed the true, the true bridge, right? Because in, in a way, like when I come across, and a lot of you, you know, I've I've I've, I've been a teacher with you in different rooms, and I, I've hung out with incredible experiences, right? Different people's experiences, and for me, like instead of I, I tend to get more irrit not irritated, but dismissive or frustrated with. Instead of feeling sympathy, I just want them to be in the truth of my experience, right? I don't even want them to feel sorry for it. I want them to be like, oh, and this was a big thing in trying to write Waking, by the way. I did not want you to feel sorry for the 13-year-old boy, right? Like, I just wanted to tell the truth of his story in Waking, such that you got to, to decide whether to pull up a chair and actually be with me as opposed to a cross from me. So, but what I like about what Kevin is saying here is that there is the, the pity is the projection, oh, your life is so tired, which is kind of the Eve stepping across the, 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 the you know, using my head as a rock, right? To step across the stream of her own life, right? Right, which is an interesting thing that one of the ways that disability is used. And, and, you know, like I have an experience where I was in People Magazine right after Waking came out, they interviewed me for three hours and, and then they didn't even mention my book or my nonprofit or mind body solutions they had the title say om amazing and they found the most drastic yoga pose that i they found online and they used that and they didn't say anything about my actual life right and that overcoming story that happens like i'm crushing it when i'm grabbing pizza rolls and i'm actually actually poisoning my son as opposed to being inspirational right right that 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 story of overcoming on the flip side of sympathy is a way for our culture to stay asleep. And this is why I think these kinds of forms are so important. It's on us a little bit to tell our stories better, to make them more interesting, to make them more diverse, to make them not be, just be inspirational, to make them be honest, to not fetch pity, to not fetch sympathy and reaction. So part of what I want our community going forward with these workshops, but also in general mind body solutions is to get better at telling stories. The, the really truthful stories about what it's like to live. And, and, and if you're telling the truth, you don't have to generate sympathy. No, and I think that that's where you're talking about, Matt, is where we wanna, where that is all meets is where we connect. I still think that the pity and sympathy is, is it's kind of like a one-way street and then either empathy or recognition to me is a two-way street. And to me, it's a, uh, and that's where we want to get. That's when, that's when you know that, that you are working with somebody is, is that when all of a sudden they stop 
projecting or uh, and then all of a sudden they see themselves in you uh, as soon as somebody see themselves in you then when they're helping you they're helping themselves and it takes all the onus off the situation yeah, and I think that, you know, because part of today is trying to be about how you do you transform this complex social energy that we are awash in, in the Coliseum, right? And, and part of it, is, that's why I liked what Kevin was saying to me in, in, when we were talking about him being on, which was the idea that sympathy is perhaps, pity is one thing, that's just about them. Sympathy is perhaps an attempt at a bridge, but the transformation is if the sympathy can transform into compassion and empathy, and then they, right, and, and so that's one way to think about transforming this energy, which I think is, is really is really important. And, and like one of the things that Kevin says to me in well, I'm body, mind, story, not just to me, what's the line, um, Kevin goes, um, compassion has a, has a shelf life. Isn't that how you say? Yeah. Compassion has a shelf life, but um, recognition is timeless. Or how do you, is that how you say it? That's, it's just, that, that is the way I feel. I feel that things like there's three, the three big ones are truth and beauty and compassion all have shelf lives. And it's things like recognition. Once we recognize each other, then that's, that's in there. That's in there to stay. Um, because once then, then a bridge has been formed, I still think, I still think compassion still leans toward one to the other, you know, you're feeling, um, you're feeling about somebody when you're feeling, but when you're, when it's empathetic, just that transfer. And, and I mean, we are talking semantics here. So however you want to define this stuff is fine. But to me, it is really important that it's a two-way street that we see each other in ourselves and each other. Yeah. So like, that's one of the things, one of the best compliments I can get about waking is when someone that has a completely different experience in mind, says that in your words, I could find words for my story, mm -hmm. right? Quite frankly, one of the things that I wanna say, and I said this last time in the last workshop about from Kevin again, dis meaning having traveled for the world of shadow and reflection. I want people to recognize and see in our experiences as we live with like diff different hardships, like see in our experiences that, that whatever you see of me, I have completely earned, right? It's not because like, like the depth that I am and the person that I am has been earned through the life I've lived and that there's wisdom there. And I do think that we need to get more sophisticated, we being this community, more sophisticated at telling our, our stories in a way to people that allow them to see the wisdom and the strength and that something about them happens when they're around us, not that they're just feeling good about what they do for us as a way to not feel what the truth is. So this is great. So Kevin, I'm gonna kind of shift a little bit. Anything you wanna say in, in closing or you got it pretty much? No, I feel so great being here and I love the last one too. I'm just, uh, thanks everybody for letting me be in on this cause yep. I'm loving it. All right, so we're gonna switch here. Does anyone have any? quick comment or or something they wanna say right now. Um, the hey, hand Matt. goes up. Matt, this is Amy. Yep. Um, Louise Edwards had a nice, interesting comment. She, she wrote, we either transform or transfer all of our experiences. I thought you guys might want to respond. No, Amy, that wasn't me. Oh, that wasn't you, Louise? Oh, no, okay. I was the one before that. We need to own the space. Oh, being, I, I'm sorry, it was not to me. It so, was Bill Sweeney. So, <laughs> so Bill, we'll get back to that. So first, I just want to, I, uh, Louise, it comes to us from, from England and, and she, she's come and trained with us. And just for a second, can we just acknowledge how wonderful her accent is? I just want to like, let that in. And so like now say what your question was and I'm just going to soak in the fact that I love how you speak. Sorry to put you on the spot. Okay. So um, uh, from my point of view, I think, um, is that, that, that we have to own the space between being marvelous and being helpless. Yeah, and I, I would say, uh, Matt and Kevin, there is a there is a big gender issue in storytelling and disability that I think we ought to look at. Tell me more bit. about that. Sorry. 
Say more about the, there's a big gender issue with this? Yes, I mean, from my experience, I, I feel that uh, um, as a woman with a disability, people are much more uncomfortable with it hmm. than, than with, with men just, just disabled. Yeah, I think there is a much more pressure. And I think many, many, you know, many of my UK friends, you know, we either, we come up with a, a persona which is often quite perky and quite showy to kind of get through life uh, yeah. and, and work hard to conform in a way yeah. that I think, you know, it's the same for all women, but it particularly applies to disabled women. Yeah, well, that makes... I think I, I got that I'm having a new thought here. Like, so like, I got to like process that. So um, I think you that, thought about gender, Matthew. I'm, no, I have yeah. thought, no, no. I think that some of the things you said in description of it are also things that I feel as a male that I also have to do, like find a way to be happy and whatever about it. But, but I do think I was wondering, and that'd be an interesting for an after hours discussion. Right. Like, like, no, I mean, like at, at the end of this, because this this is a really interesting issue to me. Right. Mm -hmm. and I think it, it warrants a whole bunch. Um, um, that, that, that I that I wonder if there's something about. About the fact that somehow and this is so dangerous to say out loud, but like like women are expected to hold the whole world together. Yeah. Including our kids, including everything. Right. And, and that then when, so like, like I remember being horrified when my mom got sick, really sick one time when I was a little kid, it was like, you can't get sick. Are you kidding me? Right. Right. Like that, that just rocked my world. And I wonder if there's something in what you have experienced as the difference, as there's some deep seated, like worry about that. Oh, if you're sick, everything collapses. Or if you have a hard life, everything collapses. But I don't know this is a good thing to bring up after at 2.30, this is a fast thing. Yeah, this could be right. a whole this, side group. Okay, but don't forget, it's 9.30 at night for me, so I'll stay for a bit, but not. Yes, well, I can't help you with not being a night owl, right? <laughs> I can not suggest drugs, but that's that's not so good. <laughs> All right, so. Um, Matt, this is Amy. We also have a couple of comments if you want to take them now. There's one from Bill Sweeney and also Laura Hallisey from Ireland's weighing in. Yeah, so Bill, why don't you quick say what you're saying and then We'll go to Laura, and then we gotta, we gotta keep moving here. Uh, all right. Well, you know, I just find without um, me coming to peace with me um, that regardless of what happens in my life, whatever experience I have, I'm either going to transfer that energy on to others and myself, or if if I have a better awareness of what is pushing me, whether it's fear or love, you know, I think those are the only two energies that that exist. Um, and I'm, I'm more aware of what is pushing me, that opens up the opportunity for transformation. And transformation is an inclusion and transferring is an exclusion for lack of, I mean, there's a lot of adjectives that go around it, yeah. but uh, it's, uh, it's an important piece for me to kind of see what fruit is being birthed out of my actions and my reactions. And right. on, on some days, are much better than others. Yesterday, I probably had some kind of nasty plums and some very, very bitter apples coming off the tree uh, that I was producing. I mean, it just is because, you know, we're all in different places every day. Well, that's uh, yeah. a really big, important thing in this is that, as you know, I don't have to tell anyone on the call, living with a disability is a marathon. It is not a sprint. Right, and you can out, it's like there are gonna be days that are just better than others. That's just like part of what it is and different things bug you more deeply at, on different days. Like, I, you know, I need to like turn away from the guy coming at me trying to tell me I'm crushing it sometimes, right? And I don't always have, and we're gonna talk about this with Chen and I'm gonna talk about this too, is like, you don't always have to be an ambassador for disability. You just get to be freaking irritated sometimes too, right? Right, and, and, and a whole bunch of things like that. Um, and then just for a quick spot back, Laura from Ireland, who is our, was, spoke with me last year, so she's making a cameo. We try to bring back our talent. Hello, I just wanted to say something 
there because it, it kind of circles back to what we were saying last week. Uh, you know, I do think it's really interesting the idea about telling our story better because, you know, I think my idea of it growing up was like I could either only be crushing it or I was getting a little bit of sympathy, which occasionally was nice because I was like, right. oh, you should see that I'm having a really hard time today. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really understand that there was a place in the middle because I didn't, you know, that wasn't really on offer. So I could either be killing it and doing an epic job of being disabled or I was just either just terribly sucking at it on any given day. And I just think part of that's probably because of the stories that are out there and the, the bit in the middle that you were talking about. So. Yeah, I just wanted to say that because I Yeah, was... one of my favorite things Laura said to me is when she found out that I'd written a book, she was like, oh, damn it, I hate books written by people with disabilities because they make me feel I'm not being able to be able-bodied well enough and then I suck at disability too. Yeah, it's I like, really those hate are, that. <laughs> those are terrible. the stories that need to be told. I mean, there's exactly this middle ground, like I call it the pit stop between um, overcoming and 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 just like feeling, having a really hard day, like the, the the resting place between the two is the ground that we have to claim. Well, that's right? part of the difficulty too is, I mean, you, it, it's where the bar is set. Like sometimes you have to be inspirational just to be normal. So that all, you're already screwed, you know, that, that you have to do something superhuman to make normal. So the perception of you is completely different than the outcome of the task, you know, that, um, yeah, or else you just, yeah, you fail miserably at, you know, and both ends. So Kevin, when in, in, in a while, when I teach a shorter practice, um, um, just to kind of get this concept out there, because it's going to affect what I teach. I'm glad I remember this is that you often say something about about trauma where where it's about being able, one of the things you have to maintain your shape or reclaim your shape. Right, and, and I want you to talk a little bit about that. And then I want to talk to you, to say a little couple of things about what I think, I think that's part of the issue of when you're navigating this world is how to maintain your shape. Yep. Well, part of that is the, I looked up the definition of resiliency and, it, and it, the definition is maintaining one's shape. So I started to think of how we are as what shape we are. And part of it is, is that the shape you're born with is just, that's that's who you are you grow from there but when your shape is altered somewhere in life you have to grow into it because you aren't that shape yet you're still your old shape and you have to grow into the person you've become and so part of that part of that transformation to me is people on your outside kind of holding you together while you grow into your new self or and you speak about this wonderfully matt about how we hold ourselves, our shape on the inside while we grow into ourselves. Yeah, um, and that's part of what I think is so complex. You know that sensation of, of when someone hurts your feelings and you feel it on the inside or something hits you, hits you in the gut or whatever. Like there's something really strange about how weird sympathy sticks in your head like a splinter or when you're really thought to be incapable or incompetent, that kind of like you know, people look at me in a wheelchair for years and years and just also readily assume that I have a mental disability. I can't tell you all the times that that's happened or they don't, they don't talk to me when I'm at the, trying to get my airplane ticket switched because I'm a savvy traveler and they imagine I'm with the other person and they talk to, you know, it's like, what, what, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? I actually, I actually know where I'm going right now. Right. And so there's, there's this like strange, like thing where, where you have to, have both, but now I do got to get to get to Chanda. Chanda, will you spotlight Chanda here? Say something so you come onto my screen. I don't even know where you are, Chanda. Here I am. I'm trying can to like. You. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I can't see you though. Oh, there you are. There are your headphones. So Chanda, so <laughs> you don't have to do it. I mean, it's, so Chanda's got one of those stories. She runs a nonprofit in Denver. It's one of the most amazing nonprofits I've ever seen happen. And just so you know, she just introduced and reintroduced a bill into the Denver legislature that allows for a waiver. So an expansion of, of a waiver so people can with, live with chronic disability can actually um, 
receive services, right? So like, I think we're looking at a future, I hate to hit it this, I'm linking governor, president type of sh stuff. I don't yeah. know. She's a dynamo and Chanda Plant Foundation is an amazing, um, an amazing, an amazing organization that, be and she'll talk a little about her story quick about, about getting people connected to alternative modalities people with, with, with chronic disabilities. She'll say more about that, but then she's got a story too, right? She's not, right? And it's one of those stories where I've been talking a little bit about it, but um, so she's eight. So I'm telling the story for her so she doesn't have to exactly because I get tired of telling my story, right? She's eight, she grabs out of the popsicle box, the red popsicle, and her older brother who's 10 and his friends don't want her to eat the red popsicle. I'm getting this right, right, Chanda? I got this right, right? And they, they're kind of mad that she took the wrong colored popsicle. And they happen to be playing with a handgun that's loaded. And they jokingly pointed at her and shoot. Okay, so then she becomes at eight years old, a quadriplegic, right? And then I want to tell, have you tell a little bit of your story, Chandler, about that, what led you to some alternative modalities and then a little bit about Chandler Plan. By the way, this is one of the coolest nonprofits I've ever seen out there. And this is, this is like, so Chandler's a little bit of a go-getter. I, I affectionately think of her as kind of like a, a little Napoleon, right? She's like, comes out of it. So she calls me up out of nowhere after reading Waking and said, you don't know this yet, but you're going to become my friend. Right, she just informs me, and and then she comes out to visit. I go out there. She's one of my best friends, right? In 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 all of this stuff. All right. So, Chanda, say some more about what led you then to Chanda Plan. Thank you, Matthew. So, um, after having my injury, it was, you know, me wanting to just live with wellness was kind of a, a fight, right? So I was put in a position where it was, here's your medication for all the things that you have to take for your spinal cord injury, right? Bowels, bladder, everything, right? Then eventually pain. Um, when I was 21, started having a lot of pain. And I would say throughout that portion of time from injury until I was, you know, in my twenties, like I was living, but I wasn't living vibrantly because I was sitting sedentary with lots of medication. And so eventually when I had started having pain, I go to the doctor and he's like, oh yeah, you know, in 03, like we, we give, we give narcotics. We, that's another thing, another secondary condition. And here's your, here, here you go. And so for me, um, I got really sick from that. I actually, um, when I look back, it's like a definitely opioid addiction, trying to deal with the pain um, was very significant. I was hospitalized for a month and did a medical intervention where they put a feeding tube in, were feeding me intravenously. And at that time saved my life. So like the weather, the Western medicine put me into the hospital and I needed the medical intervention to save. Right. So then in that moment, getting to a place where um, the physician said, okay, well, we saved your life, go back and do what you're doing before. And I was like, what? No way. And so I'm not going to do that. And so with that, my, um, sister who's actually practiced in uh, underneath Matthew and various workshops. I'm sure doing study with us at my body solutions. You know, yeah. Crystal. And, and so she brought up to me, Hey, in my physician and my mom, like, why aren't we doing something different with integrative healthcare, acupuncture, massage, chiropractic, physical therapy, yoga, all the things to basically give the body what it deserves and what it's missing um, given that Chanda can't move it on it on her own, right? And so I always use this mantra that movement is life in whatever capacity that we can do that, whether that's through breath or through um, various things. And even if we have to use other humans to move our bodies for it to get what it deserves in the right capacity, then heck yes. And so um, I started doing all of those services and I'm sitting here talking to you guys today because of it. And so with it saving my life and doing research and finding out that it wasn't just my story, it was other people's story. Um, I started an organization 16 years ago to make sure that there were not financial barriers in order for people to get access to those services. So whether that be through donor dollars, 
But also for me, it's all about systemic change. Like I, I don't want us to be um, reliant on donor dollars. I want Medicaid and the funders of healthcare to do what's right for people. And so that's always that the systemic change is the right piece, but we have to combine them together until the bodies that fund the dollars get all the way there, which takes a very long time. So that's, that's my story. Yeah, well, it's, that's only the beginning of the story. One thing I do want you to describe really quick, which I think is incredibly cool that Chan is doing with the, with the Chan plan is, is that because she's trying to create and it's being studied, she's opened a center in Denver that's like got, it's interdisciplinary, right? So talk a little bit about, about what, what your, your, your actual location and why you did it. Because she got tired of there not being very many, much medical doctor awareness that's good for long-term disability. And so, and she put together this model that if it works, you guys, it will literally transform the model of care for people with disability. Yeah, so the, the Chanda Plan Foundation, it raises the money, but we have a way in which we deliver the services, right? So it's the Chanda Center for Health. Eventually, like I tried to get my name out of it. I promise you guys, I did not want to name everything. I'm like, please name it something else. And we after think time, we don't protest too much, but we'll just keep going from there. Okay. So basically, um, at the center, what was really critical is that we listened to our consumers all the time, right? So we were wanting underneath one roof to give multiple interdisciplinary services. So acupuncture, massage, chiropractic, physical therapy, care coordination, behavioral health, um, yoga. And then we have primary care and we also do dental. And so with all of that, with the lens of disability competence. So what's really difficult is we didn't want, and we want individuals to come into a space that one feels very therapeutic because we all know that we experience healthcare where it's sterile and cold and white. And it's like, so what's, so why, but why can't it feel therapeutic? Why can't, why can't we feel good about accessing healthcare? And so we were really critical about that component, but then also the accessibility. We wanted people to come in and be able to feel as though um, when they wheel into a treatment room and they have their massage therapist, that the massage therapist doesn't look at them being scared, but looks at them like, yep, got this. Like with you and I, we're gonna get like, we'll get you on the table. We understand urine bags. We're not scared to pee. We if you accidentally, like, you know, have an involve, like it's these things where it's like, it takes us back to our human elements. And it reminds us that we all have certain situations, but yet we all want to be able to help access healthcare where we know providers are competent and that providers are going to deliver services in a way that really impacts our life. And so then also all of the providers have the ability to really work with each other to be on the same page for the end user, which I think is also critical. And um, that way you're not having to advocate about one particular item five different times with five different providers. And not to say that we have that down perfectly, but like that's the structure, right? The inter interdisciplinary, the collaboration and the, the disability lens. So you have, you have medical doctors there, a couple of medical yeah. doctors, right? You have yeah. acupuncturists, massage therapists, Yoga classes, what else? Um, chiropractic, uh, behavioral health, care coordination, dental, and then primary care. All in one location that talks to each other, that actually is aware of the whole or arc of disability, right? The whole story of it. And, that, and then she's also trying to, and that's getting studied by UCLA, but she's also trying to figure out how to get doctors better educated on long-term disability, right? I mean, like, about what it's like to help someone. Cause you and I run in the same thing after 42 years. I can tell you, I, I've never encountered a doctor that has not been dealt with spinal cord injury 42 years out, right? They don't know what to say, they don't know what to do, right? And so trying to figure that, isn't that one of your goals over time too, is figure that out? Yeah, so we're just starting, like we're starting an educational platform where actually physicians and MAs and the, the healthcare providers can actually go and learn about disability from various things like because a lot of people won't take on individuals with disabilities as patients because of the unknowns or they think that you know they can't be accessible and it's like 
you know, you don't have to spend a lot of money to be accessible. And at the same time, there's like, there's requirements by the federal government that say that you have to have certain things and they don't. And yet we don't have a level of enforcement that goes around and says, hey, 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 hey. And so therefore we have a population of people with disabilities that live within, we're, we're a health disparity group because of this very reason that we don't have disability competence within the healthcare world and healthcare providers. And so if we don't offer a platform for education and we continue to experience providers that don't have any education because you don't get it in your, you know, your in in school. Like there's very little curriculum around disability when you're getting your um, you know, you're becoming a doctor, a nurse, it, all those those um schooling. So in other words, she's trying to take over the world. Just so I mean like dynamo comes to mind she, you know just so you know like they raise a lot of money they're doing amazing stuff but now she's just shifting back to this you know and it's a story of someone that's transformed transformed their experience right into something or into something big and major which a lot of us we don't need to do we just need to get better at telling our stories you know what i mean like and seeing the implications of our own stories right and being able to articulate them well one of the things that that I think is, and as, and, you know, maybe we should have, have a, oh God, I don't want to say something that's going to make my, 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 um, my staff have a, a, a rapid heart attack here soon. It might be really cool, Kevin, to do a body mind story for people to figure out a couple of disability stories or in, you know, like me, like Rose stepping on my head across the river of her own life, right? Getting good at these stories. They need to get out there, right? And so maybe we we can provide a way to help some of those things because I think something really important happens, and this is one of the things I've learned from Kevin and from Patricia Francisco, who teaches that with us, is that is that when you not only have your story and feel like you have something you shouldn't tell or it's embarrassing, right? And, and you realize you let in that if you add a little art to your storytelling, a beginning, middle, end, some of the tricks of the trade that the story because you allow in the potential of a listener actually transforms itself right you, you know it's no longer you just telling an anecdote about your life it actually hits a new level that which allows more of the world to hear your story right which is and it's also kind of fun so put that in our parking lot everybody on mind body solutions that we're just going to create a quick little huge undertaking um but 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 chanda so just so you know, so Chan is also a yoga student, came in and has come a couple times to the Twin Cities here. But talk about how you deal with sympathy a little bit re relative to your everyday life. Well, I mean, I think that one of the things that I feel like I've done with uh, sympathy is I always try to see where I'm showing up with it, right? So we're going to experience that level right between pity or sympathy every single day of our lives, depending on like when we leave if at this point, if we leave the home or not. Right. But when, but, but when we do, what's really, what's really critical is like how I'm going to allow it to affect my day. Right. And granted, Matthew, you said it earlier, it all depends on what kind of day we're having too, because at the end of the day or the beginning of the day, we're, we're all human, right? So I always find that I'm I'm checking in with how I'm showing up for it because their words are going to happen whether I want them to or not. And so then therefore I've got to figure out how do I meet those words and how it affects yeah. my day. And so there'll be days where I'll be pissed. I'll be, you know, at the the experience or the comment or whatever it might be. And then there's other days where I'm going to have a little bit of flexibility where I I have sympathy for <laughs> sympathy for them in return, right? And so where it's so I think that that is really where I've been finding myself at this point in my life, living with a spinal cord injury for over 30 years, um, seeing seeing how much power I allow it in my life. Yeah, I mean one of the things I one of the stories that you and I were talking about this too that I liked um was you would you're doing some sort of i think it's at the china plan foundation center but like the um you're doing some new therapy that's giving you some more mobility right 
then this is such a funny little thing where where and it allowed her to put on her own jacket if she wants to talk about that dilemma yeah so the stronger I became, I was actually filling out a survey and then I looked over at my staff and I was all like, oh, I don't want them to know that I can put on my coat by myself because then they won't help me. And so I tell my staff and Maggie go, and she goes, that's really messed up, Chanda. And I said, it is, it's either you, there's two things. I'm either paralyzed or lazy today. And guess what? You won't get to know. So I think that that goes back to that sympathy thing too, where it's like, and, and Matthew actually really helped me with that because he said, Chanda, we, we struggle, oh, and Matthew, I don't know if you want to say it, but like you, we struggle in silence all the time. So then when we are with people, can you say it? Because you said it so much better. I don't know what you're going to say. So I'm still when, trying to figure when, out what When we're say. with people, it's okay to accept help. But when we're because we're, when we're alone, we struggle, we struggle with the, the everyday things is what we talked about. Remember? remember yeah, I don't know what you're talking about, but yes, whatever Chana said, there is, but, there is this like different, there's th like, I like this, I love this like attitude, you know, and it sounds like exactly what Chanda would say, right? This is one of the things like, I, I literally love being around Chanda because she says like that, I'm either lazy today or, 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 or whatever was the other word you said, like, or I'm, lazy or you should feel sorry for me what, paralyzed what is paralyzed and you don't get to know which one is true i love that turn only i right do. like because it's like there are days where you know i gotta tell you um there are days you should use your disability think of all the freaking time that you put in and it sucks right if there's an occasional, if you get to take cuts in the COVID vaccine line, okay. If you get to all of a sudden have someone like, if you need to go, I mean, how many times, well, like I'm going through a doorway, let's say, and someone wants to like rushes to hold open the door, but they stand in the doorway, right? Like, so I can't even get through the door. And then I have to gently move them because they're trying to help so bad, right? That like, there are times where if someone wants to let me take cuts, I just am quiet mm -hmm. and go, yeah, okay, cool. I don't- and Matthew, you know, that, what you just said there was exactly what I was referring to is like that, that helped me that day. Cause I was all like, oh my goodness, because I can do more, I, I shouldn't ask for it. And it's like, but wait a second. Like when I'm by myself, like I got it, I got, a, I got a lot of work to do. And so when I'm with some people, I'll use my service dog and them. <laughs> I love it when I, when I got to move people to get things done. That's exactly right. I mean, there are times where, and I try not to like take advantage of that too much. Like I don't go to that well where I'm just letting, you know, letting someone help me when I don't really, really need help. But I've found over time, my air has not been on taking help. It's been on rejecting help and pushing it away. That's where I've made more of my mistakes, mm -hmm. not the other way around. And, I, and, and that is something about me that I've got to look at. Like, what is it that I'm still trying to prove 42 years later, right? What, it, what is it, what is the cultural meme or the expectation that I'm thinking that somehow I should feel bad that if the one out of the hundred times that I have to like do this or, or to put on your jacket, Chen, like, like, like that I actually want the help, it's okay. And but the person I have to convince is me that it's okay right because mostly people want to help for the right reasons they literally don't know the energy of how to do it it's because they have like i mean anyone had this well, well i used to put my wheelchair in out of my car and people that's where they really feel sorry for me when something takes extra long like me watching kevin put on his shoes right and it takes extra long you want to run in and help and so when I can always tell someone's going to run toward me and try to help me put my wheelchair in my car. And I'm like, and I, they're so intense on wanting to help because they think it's so awful to have to take an extra little bit of time to put my wheelchair in the car that even though I say, no, I got this, it doesn't matter. It gets run over like a river, the damn bus. And then there's so, there've been multiple times where I've had someone put my wheelchair in my car when I was doing that. And then they wedge it in so bad. I can't get it out. 
And there's some of that help falls into that category where they actually make things worse. Mm-hmm. And because it's so much about their wanting to help, but that doesn't mean it's necessary. You know, you got, I smile at them and feel sorry for them, right? Like yeah. too bad they can't sit and be in this space a little bit better. Um, any comments or questions for Chanda? Reactions? I know we're talking about experiences we've all had, right? This is the, I mean, this is everyone's freaking experience. And Matt, um, lots of, Matt, this is Amy. Lots of comments in the chat box about um, help, quote, in quotes. Um, love that folks help you with transfers, almost put you on the floor. Um, people also understanding the struggle about having people help you and, and wanting to do it uh, yourself. Yeah, I mean, and, and this, again, strategies on how to, like, receive help i'm probably not the best one to do it i freaking suck at it right i still should take more help and i i'm always late to the party of 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 saying no i actually should just take this space right so that's something that the balance between taking help and you know i I also i like want to go back to what i think is deeper a little bit in the you don't get to know if i'm paralyzed or i'm lazy um that separation between what's occurring outside of you and what's occurring inside of you, that, 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 that's something that I want you to own with grace, right? Not just claim by being angry, you know, like that's my, you know, you, there's a little bit of like F you, I get to choose, but there's also like, no, guess what? You get to choose because the experience of disability is so relentless. Of living, with, of living with a disability, it's so relentless that you do get to choose. You do get to choose. And, and, and I think that, you know, Chan, another thing you said that I thought was, was you know, like I, I can only control how I relate to it or I, I need to figure out how I, I relate to it. I think that that is part of, of deciding, and this is why I wanna get shortly here into the practice that helps you keep your shape right? Because there's going to be all these things swirling around you. And, and um, how do you decide when you want to interact with it and when you don't? There's not, there are times where, where I just don't actually, I just want to grab the pizza rolls and put them in my freaking cart. I don't want anything else, right? And, and I don't, and unfortunately, I still am wearing that guy because he was so in my space, like I can still feel them as I'm talking to you, but it's like, there are times where, where I, I, I want to get to a point and help you get to a point where you have your space well enough that somebody can offend you through that space and it can pass on and you can use exhalation to let it pass on. You can be touched by a help that you really needed that you didn't know you needed. One of the, some of the most profound times is when someone finally does help me gracefully and right and really wonderfully and I didn't know I needed the help as much as I did and it's one of the best exchange I have a few of those exchanges where it's like oh my god you had no I had no idea I needed this so much Poppy I see your hands up sorry it took a while to get to um the view button yeah just so many things in short just relatable uh for someone who is amatory but has so many connections with stories about Matt, Kevin, Chanda. And the, the one that I have been working on for a really long time and still working on, and there's a lot that I can relate with you, Matt, is that relationship with so many years, I distanced myself with the acknowledgement of disability because um, I guess in my perspective, after like looking at so many lenses and there's obviously there's so many ways that we could go and keep continuing to talk about this is I, for a long time, I did a lot of like person language first related to disability. And I realized for myself, and I can only speak for myself because everyone has their own opinion about disability recognition first or person first language, but I purposely unknowingly use person language first to distance myself from the acknowledgement of my disability, but also it allowed me to distance myself from 
from it and that created a lot of bad habits. Can you give a quick example of what you mean by person first language and whatever? Sure, person, um, and again, in the disability community, it's, it's very divided. Uh, so it would be like, for example, in an article, or if you're addressing me, it would be like, this is Poppy Sunquist versus saying, Poppy has CP. So it's use, recognizing me as a human being first mm -hmm. versus verbally or written wise, recognizing the disability words now, I'm on the other end of the spectrum is because I want that recognition, not for sympathy, not for uh, of, of inspiration or inspiration porn. I want that recognition because of like we've been talking about, so many of our stories are not rep either represented well in media and, and written articles. So I want to reclaim that, that acknowledgement and decide how I'm going to take that energy. If I'm going to have, quote, as Chanda <laughs> used her, her coinage, have a paralyzed day and allow that help, whereas the old me would be like, nope, I got this. Right. But so many years of my life that I have uh, created trouble within my mind, within my mind-body relationship, within my perceptional self of who I am. But also what I am really learning through uh, a meditation practice is the soul. The, when you speak of I, you're speaking of yourself, your yep. soul. You have the ability to disconnect from the emotion of letting it affect you negatively and just accept what it what it could be. This is a great segue into how I want to teach a practice now, right? Whatever, you know, remember there's just words and semantics and 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 then there's the actual experience. What she's saying is that like she's using the word soul, right? As 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 the place that's separate from and connected to. Right. So one of the things that I want to like in those last few minutes try to just do a practice about is being able to get better at getting back to the idea of a shape that you have a shape that's both created by perceptions around you, but you also have a shape from inside to out. You have dimension within that, that if you only have your dimension within mentally, it's going to be more fragile. Mm. So one of the reasons why I started Mind Body Solutions and teach yoga and, and share, try to share yoga is to help people realize dimension in what using the body to make them know that it's much more resilient and expansive when it's not just mentally or emotionally perceived. That in fact, it's something that I need to practice and own. Right. And I need to practice it, not just by reflecting and introspecting with my head. I need to actually live it through my spine, out through my limbs. And when I take up my own space. And when I mean take up my own space, I mean, take up what I can control on the inside and what I can't control. When I take up the space that I inhabit, I am less subject to and affected by lack of understanding and appreciation from what's from the outside. Because at the end of the day, your experience, all of you on this call is going to be your experience. And no matter how much, I mean, we've all, I'm so sick of telling my story. That's why I told Chanda's story quick for her. So she'd have to say it for the hundred thousandth time, like about what happened and why I talked about Kevin quick is like that part of my story I'm tired of, right? And, and but but I but it's something that allows people to realize kind of what what Poppy's saying like it's an acknowledgement of like you know what there's a serious story going on here, and and that's what I want people to pay attention to, and so sit up straight and tall. This idea of feeling from inside to out. This is what I don't. I one of the reasons why I was not I was attracted to asana was was because because I wanted. I didn't just want to reflect and go inward. I wanted this dimension that I that is within me to actually be proactive into the world. 
not so so i was never just wanting to reflect and meditate damn it i just want to live this body is an the is the best express um mode of expression whatever i am will ever have if i can live from inside to out from my life force if i fill up my own space but that also means being able to separate it right it's it's one of those paradoxes so sit up straight and tall one of the things that actually really helps with with um is is to first find the sensation of space right to be able to create it and and if i just try to think of it like a math equation that's never going to work so one of the things that i want all of you to get better and better at is being able to soften your organs of perception right so relax from the temples the skin on the face but don't just go towards relaxation i want you to like soften your jaw the inside of your mouth relax your belly to relax your throat balance your head over your neck start the process of allowing that your emptiness that you carry with you all the time has dimension right so at first there's a letting go to allow the sensation of your inward emptiness to have dimension because your mind is scared of it a little bit your mind perceives your depth usually as vulnerability so you're softening letting your brain ungrip but now i want you to start to activate and i think how you activate right because i'm worried of people's judgments in the world as when i was first injured and trying to prove everything is okay i didn't have my own body in relationship to my outward experience enough because i was always trying to compensate for it so the practice of inward and then realizing that that inward dimension I'm putting my hands on the table, right? Grounding the feet. Now I can put structure under my emptiness. I can combine emptiness with strength, right? And that is a really important part of keeping your shape, right? Is to not be downtrodden by judgment and like sympathy around you, but to actually know that your own emptiness is underneath you is you can put strength in it so start to feel your feet your sitting bones start lifting up the front of the chest now if i get i want you to know as you're lifting it broadening across the chest right i want you to drop a curtain down your back body right a silk curtain because i want you to stay soft even when you're being strong right this is part of the claiming of the inward dimension of your shape right it's full your shape is always full right and our bodies tend to do this when we go inward right and we tend to think it's not an expansive state no expansion is physical and it includes inner dimension so hit down and then you start to just feel your breath so i want your rib cage as you're softening the organs of perception to feel the rib cage right expand the first few breaths it expands on the outside and you can feel how it lifts your chest but now i want you to feel the inner circumference of your rib cage i want you to go inward and outward hit down through your sitting bones extend down through your inner heels lift your chest you have an inside and an outside this is the place that we don't put life through right as much as we could and movement you're going to find that it's refines a yoga pose all right so there's another space i want you to get so lean forward so if you need to <clears throat> i'm i'm not going to use the table anymore i'm going to use the my my own legs right here's another i want all of you to have more space in your low back okay and i want you you to be able to like create the sensation of space because if you don't inflate your own space other people's judgments will okay and so you've got to figure out how to claim it and it's not just a mental barrier right so i want you to hit down through your sitting bones and lift up through your chest so i want you to hit down and lengthen that low back right and i want you to add another level of dimension feel where your feet are on the floor and broaden right across your low back and then extend from the inner groin to the inner knee 
and down through the foot and lift your chest. And now take a couple breaths, feel the expansion of your rib cage, but also the inner circumference of the expansion. Be on both sides of that. Strength is not just on the outer side of your rib cage. It's on the inner side. The inner side is going to be more apparent if you ground your sitting bones and your heels. I want to live from inside to out. I'm tired of taking care of everyone else. All the, the people that project somebody trying to show them that they, it's not deserved, all that stuff. And then come on back. And then I'm going to lift up. So I want a sense of lightness. So the thing about the journey inward is that it, it should be light. Right? So I'm going to lift up, put myself in traction a little bit. And then let, watch and I sink back down. Right? So I'm going to feel it again. <clears throat> then it, like putting... Now I'm going to ground, my, ground your sitting bones, your feet, come forward. On an exhale, push off. On an inhale, feel the back of your chair. Now here's a space that I want you to get better at strongly putting into the world. The space in the center of your chest, and I mean this space not as an emotion, not as like a nice touchy-feely thing, but as a projection. So I'm going to have you go back against the back of your chair, up and over your chair, and think about the center of your chest sprouting water, right? Like it's just coming out of you. That is yours to give away or not. Are you paralyzed? Are you lazy? Well, it depends. Sometimes then I'm going to drop, right? This connection between me and the outside, it's my choice. Right. It's uh, and I want it in the way, you know, that. then, by the way, this is the most connected space. I think in human consciousness is in this is this part of the spine. So inhale again. Feel the tips of your shoulders, the tops of your heads, the bottoms of your feet, your sitting bones. Exhale, come forward. Um, especially watch the exhale, because the exhale is going to deliver you more calm. Right. <clears throat> So the great thing about exhale is that it, 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 it quiets you down on some level, but it also is the beginning of action. So, and then come on back for a second. So, so when you exhale and you empty in a yoga pose, that's one of the times you actually work again through gravity. So inhale up, exhale forward. Inhale, lift your chest. Exhale. I hope you've been able to feel your breath all the way down because when you pay attention to your ribcage, you can feel your feet more. Right? And your sitting bones. Practice a few breaths. Right? Your exhalation when you're the most empty is when you move through the world best. And then come on back up. So inhalation is going to give you energy. Exhalation is going to go into action, right? So inhale, take your arm up. Feel the inhalation, change your ribcage. Here's a place, like, I got to feel my ribcage more. Exhale, down. Inhale, take your arm behind you, wherever it goes. Now I'm going to ground here. You know why? Because I want to own from inside to out. I want to know and know my own dimension. My own dimension is my shape. My dimension has what I can feel and what I can't feel in it, right? Inhale and start to lift the chest, exhale, revolve. So I enter the world as I deplete myself and empty myself out, but I bring it into action, right? So you inhale and feel the expansion and you exhale and revolve. And it's not about the twist. It's not about how far you can twist. It's about adding dynamic energy that nobody can see and then come on back to center. Twists are incredibly dynamic. So much of your mind-body practice is creating a form of resilience and strength that is unseen. 
right? It's not about the poses and how much you can do. It's whether you've got a fundamental dynamic happening. It never has to be seen by somebody. You just need to know it's there. Inhale, take the your other arm up. Hit down through your sitting bones and reach for the sky, but don't just reach and strive. Bring the sky down to your fingertips, right? Bring it down, hit down through your sitting bones. Rise up to touch it. It meets you. It's not just about striving. Your life will meet you. And then exhale. And then inhale, bind your other arm. Exhale and lift your chest. And then let the inner circumference of your ribcage be felt. Hit down through your sitting bones. Exhale, and there's a dynamic energy that can transform you in the twist. It also can cleanse you. How do you get rid of somebody that's offended you on the inside? Right, and then come on back to center. How do you get rid of the dirty energy or the dirty water in a, in a, in a dish rag, right? You squeeze it. You fill up and you squeeze it and you let it out on exhalation, right? Keep your own shape by not letting it get polluted, like by the things you don't want and you get to be in charge. So again, twists, I'm telling you, I want you to get better at about exhalation and letting things go. On exhalation, you can let go of past time, an encounter, a thing you wish you had said, right? or the, something you didn't say that you wish you had, like the haunting is on the inner dynamic. That's a place we need to get better at, right? So we're gonna twist one more time. Inhale, take the arm up. Again, don't think you just have to reach farther to get where you're going. Bring where you're going towards you, down through your sitting bones, up through your arm where you're going already touches you. Breathe into that. Find where your strength is and then exhale it back down. Reground. The, you know, what we, what we tell people and then grab the other arm, right? On inhalation, I'll tell you in a second. <clears throat> Inhale, feel the expansion, exhale. And by squeezing your midline a little bit, reclaim your emptiness, transform it. It's yours. Good. And then come on back to center. Feel in the center. And then inhale, take your arm up. Exhale, be in charge, make it dynamic. Your shape, it's mostly unseen. It's only for you. Feel the inhalation hit down through your sitting bones. Lift up your chest, exhale, revolve. Squeeze out the things you don't want in there. One more breath, inhale, exhale, revolve. Good, and then come on back to center. Be in the center. So one of the things that is really important, not just for trauma survivors, but, but even when you need energy, is that exactly often when you think you should, you should recede for energy, you should expand. So, and, and the thing is, for someone that doesn't, so let's say someone offends me, let's say we're talking about offense because it's more dramatic, right? When someone offends me, I could fire back. I lose energy when I fire back. Okay. And I can decide to do that sometimes. And I'm not very good at firing back, right? Because I'm going to choose to have my shape in relationship to what's outside of me. Right. So instead of firing back, I'm going to ground first. This happens on so many different interactions 
right? Where you choose to have your inward dimension lead your response. So when, when, when Chanda was saying, like, I got to decide how I relate to it. This is like one way to think about it is how much are you going to fill your body today, right? And recognize where, it, where your strength is. And so your best boundary between you and the world, right, is your emptiness. And the, the body and the yoga pose is going to show you how to catalyze emptiness. There are other times where you need to take the same emptiness and let in a compliment. And let in help. And let in support. So it all isn't about the strong energy. It's about claiming the quieter energy so you can receive. All these things are happening in yoga poses. You're, there's a constant interplay between in and out. Like if you're having a, 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 like a blue time, literally let more sunlight in your eyes and look up. Look up more rather than down. And I can tell you that with a disability, both literally and, me and metaphorically, we look down more than we look up, except if you're Michael. Michael's really good at looking up, right? All right, but like this, that, that there's a tendency to like let in light, but you get to choose. You get to choose when you let in light. You get to choose when you like maintain your shape. You get to choose when you decide to let go, right? And all this is how you navigate. It matters, and this is part of age talking, it really doesn't matter what people think. Try to convince that to a 13 year old though, that's tough. To a 21 year old, right, that's tough. Right, like, you know, like think about, I heard a line from somebody this week that they remember from their psychology class in college said, um, the line was, once you reach 10 years old, you'll never make a decision that's basically based only on your own considerations. Because you have more awareness of other people. Like when I'm nine, let's let me get it. Like, I'm just thinking I'm gonna do this because I want to. When I'm 10, I have enough awareness of my parents, of my friends, that everything changes, right? And, and this shift, of awareness of other is a powerful, important shift, right? And it doesn't mean I shouldn't be aware of it. It means that I have to have my shape in relationship to a complicated world. That's what you get to do. And I'm gonna tell you, it's your body that shows you your shape. Not just if it looks good enough, not just if you're wearing the right clothes, it's your bones. It's the space between your bones. It's your muscles. It's softening your jaw. Your shape is mostly intangible. And you get to choose presence and what comes in and what comes out. Sometimes things come in, so I get surprised. Someone says something or betrayals one of those energies that feels really intense that surprises me when you expect a sharp word from someone you thought you would never get a sharp word then that's when I need to practice exhalation. That's when I like actually need to let my mental content, let it go. So we have to close up here. I'm going to stay on and we're going to keep talking if you want to. But I want you to know the inward dimension of you is dynamic. It's dynamic and it is not subject to judgment. It's only subject to judgment if you're disembodied. And unfortunately with disability, we've tried, the tendency is to overcompensate and in the, in the process to disembody. It's hard to embody though. That's why I have a nonprofit and I spent my life trying to help people embody. You know why? Because I need to do it too. All right, everybody, hands together if you can. You can say namaste. We're going to stay on comments, whatever you want to stay on. Namaste.